that's what I want. Let's build a team. Like, let's get this right and and make make this easier on that quarterback position so that you know no matter who's behind center we can uh we can sit there and have some success now speaking of who's behind center i i know i sent this to you on twitter i just want to kind of share this low snap I mean, that's the ball getting stuck on the turf somehow, but, like, I guess you're putting too much weight. I don't think Lucas Patrick can move anymore, and when you put that much weight on a ball and then you snap it, I don't think it could even reach. I think that guy's just an absolute injury-plagued, stiff-as-a-board dude who just needs to stop playing football. That but it's just one small, one small example of the big-picture problem here. Like, if – Man, if you're playing quarterback and you can't even get a snap without worrying yeah. about it, I mean, I made a full video that's like, you know, I think one and a half, two minutes long of fields reaching up for the ball, <laughs> reaching left for the ball. Mm-hmm. That, that, like, dude, it's all over the place. This guy has been playing center in this league for a while, and, and he can't snap the ball. Like, that's where I kind of put blame on the coaching staff. Why is he in there? Just at this point, put Doug Kramer in there. Put anybody in there. Shit, hire me. I I could snap like that. Like if that's what the production you're getting, then ah, you gotta you gotta change that somehow and, and do something. But you know that's what I mean. It, it's a team effort here. We have so many faulty positions and holes everywhere that I am not so much concerned with the quarterback position anymore. Like I think Fields has the two years. We have a good quarterback number two. Let's figure the rest of this out. And and then if if we can kind of build this up in the next year or two, and if Fields isn't the guy, then hopefully we'll be in a much, much, much better position to whoever comes in next has a much easier time to develop and try and succeed. I mean, that's got to be the route we go. you know. And, and a lot of teams that do that, um, I'll give you one example. The Broncos, they had Tim Tebow starting. Tim Tebow. You know what happened? They were a, a, a good offense, but with Tim Tebow at the quarterback position. And the year after that, they went out and signed a veteran in Peyton Manning and Super Bowl. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So if you build the offense up, if you build a team around about you can even reach out for a veteran in free agency if you want to. It opens up a little bit more options for – you know yeah. how you can win in this league, and it's I easier to replace one position, even if it's the quarterback position, than it is to replace and have to scramble to replace five, because you got this great quarterback, but now we need two receivers, a left tackle, a center, and a tight end, and you know, hey, we can do that in one off season. No, well, it's pretty hard to. So you know, I think the the Lucas Patrick situation reminds me of a lot of, uh, I think, a, just the placating and of a coaching staff member. So Luke gets, just coming from green Bay and just being like, I need a guy who understands my verbiage and my system and this and that, and just making, making him feel a little bit better for some reason when he doesn't really deserve to, If you can't coach a center or backup center into doing what you need to do. Then that's a coaching problem. Not because you needed the center to come over to help you. I think that's a weird thing. Some teams do do that where they bring in some players from an old system to make it make sense, but that makes you more sense do-do. when it's a guy like, <laughs> but, uh, it, nah. But that makes more sense when you get a guy like Aaron Rodgers and Nate Hackett, and then you just want to make him more comfortable instantly because he's only got two years with your team. Whereas Luke Getz, he's an offensive coordinator who ideally will build up from the ground up. This this reminds me of another situation earlier this year on the same coaching staff, and that's why when we give benefit of the doubt to the coaching staff and then they do the same thing again, that's where you can start going – red flags going off and you just understand that maybe us giving you know giving coaching staffs a a pass because one week they're pretty good and one week they're pretty bad that means that they are what you hate the most inconsistency what is so hard about being consistent if this reminds me of the situation of chase claypool you let this lack of accountability go on way too long at that position He leaves, and now all of a sudden, everybody's playing a little better. Everybody's playing a little bit harder. I think offensive linemen near Lucas Patrick and Cody Whitehair are pretty annoyed. 
I think Tevin Jenkins is out there busting his butt, doesn't have a second contract yet, hasn't been extended, and then Braxton Jones comes back from injury next to Darnell Wright. And I saw some times where it looks like one of those ideal NFL pockets where it's two guys on the edge and just a nice wall of three on the front. But that wall of three, I mean, collapsed within two seconds. And you just have these two guys holding on for dear life on the edge and the front. And that's just what it's what Matt Eberflus wants from his defense. But it happens to your offense every time because you have absolutely nobody up front. Tevin Jenkins can't do it all on his own. When you got Cody Whitehair and Lucas Patrick fighting for their lives, anybody can get, can beat them. And then you have Tyson Bajan and Justin Fields running for their lives. I think if you put even Doug Kramer, just a healthy young man who can push some guys around, I think his snaps could be worse than Lucas Patrick, and he still might be better. I don't understand this lack of accountability on Lucas Patrick and Cody Whitehair. Why? Because they're just veterans. You have you have young guys behind them. Throw Jatiree Carter. At least he's a young, healthy, strong body. Throw in Doug Kramer. At least he's a strong, young, hungry kid who wants to play that position and has played that position for a long time. I don't understand this. This is this is where this coaching staff does not get the pass from me. And even today, I don't know if you saw this, but like Greeny having his Chicago ties and everything, talking about how there's rumblings. Like if Matt Eberflus, God forbid, loses this coaching, if this if this game to Carolina – there's going to be a change of coach or I think Antonio Pierce with the Raiders. And if, you know, Kevin Warren is looking and watching that happen. So I'm hoping there's just some more accountability soon. And I, I hope, but I pro I know there won't be any. One thing I wanted to bring up is, you know, Deeks view uh, at Deeks view OG on Twitter. He was with us here about a month ago. Um, he tweeted something that I, I really liked. And he said, this staff has Tyler Scott playing fullback. I don't know if you saw mm-hmm. that play or not. Yeah. Kareem Blasting game. Yeah. Kareem Blasting game playing slot wide receiver. Cole Komet playing quarterback. Yannick Ngakwe playing middle linebacker. Jervon Dexter playing defensive end. Andrew Billings dropping back into coverage. And two centers that both can't snap. And a wide receiver who cannot catch getting crunch time targets. It's like, listen, if you want to put blame on the coaching staff, that that's how you do it. Like, yeah. 100%. That is mismanagement of your players right there. And, you know, if we want to talk about play calling or this and that or whatever, you know, I'm not going to get too – I'm not going to pick these guys apart like that. But but this, yeah, like you're you're a two-win football team. You, you can't be gambling like that. Like you have to put these guys in a position where they win. Like, listen, if you're the Chiefs and you want to try something stupid, you know, you've earned that right. But – we haven't. So stop being cute. You know, stop stop pretending you could play chess when you're playing checkers and, and just fucking get a win. It'd be like at least put these guys in a position where they could succeed. I think there's some times where like even the smartest the smartest coaches in history just break it down and say it's a simple game. It's one guy hitting another guy and trying to go forward. Right. And it's and, and that's the frustrating part where I think these are the guys where, and we said this like at the beginning, they get so cute. They get so cute with it. Valus Jones is in the game three times total, and it's either to return a kick or to do a jet sweep. And that's not creative. That's cute. Everybody knows what you're doing. Just because he's in there very little doesn't mean it's not obvious. At the same time, Valus Jones is wasting a roster spot. It, I mean, it, it, say I don't care how you feel about it, but that's insulting to so many players in the NFL that are like busting their butt to try to make a team and who could produce and help you in some way, some form. Even a guy on special teams, you got that Taylor guy from Cincinnati basically to just fair catch punts because Valus Jones couldn't do it. I haven't seen this guy return one punt in the whole season, like not a considerable one. And so if you're wasting a roster spot on a guy just to return kicks and do gadget plays, and then he can't play wide receiver, this is similar to what Devin Hester was on this team, except it's insulting to even mention them in the same na- in the same breath, yeah. right? Because at least Devin Hester produced in one on area. some level, and then and then he yeah. could actually play at a, a little bit of Hall of Fame stuff. level in one area right? at a Hall of Fame level. But this is just a waste of a roster spot, and then this is going to get cute where you know fourth and one lately the last few weeks you know they're hey it's tyson let's just tush push let's brotherly shove it let's qb sneak it they didn't get cute the last few weeks 
And I had this weird sneaking suspicion in the back of my mind. As soon as Fields comes back, you're going to see a fourth and one against Carolina, and it's going to be some sort of shotgun RPO draw because now we got our we got our toys back. We can get creative again. And it's not creative. It's stupid. You have the big one of the biggest, strongest quarterbacks in the league, and instead of QB sneaking for one yard, you just, hey, let's one, two, option, maybe something – this isn't cute. You're just, you're paralysis by analysis. You're thinking yourself into a mental pretzel and you're just completely shitting the bet. So yeah. just stop it. Be simple. Your tight end should play tight end. Your rush defensive end should play rush defensive end, right? Tyler Scott is smaller than Darnell Mooney and you're asking him to block. If, if you don't have the people on your roster to do, to do these things, that's on your part for roster mismanagement and poor roster construction have a backup fullback on your practice squad for christ's sake get trayvon wesco back in here he played here last year right or whatever his name was trayvon wesco i think it was all right devon wesco you know put him on the practice squad as a flex tight end that can play some fullback i mean what are we doing here so i don't know i mean i just think i think i'm scared of People getting healthy again, we're going to see some more shenanigans that is just going to piss everybody off all over again. So I spent, you know, the first good portion of this this show or podcast or whatever you want to call it, um, telling you why statistics without context are complete bullshit. And I am going to be a complete hypocrite and throw a bunch of statistics without context to make my next point. <laughs> so, okay. hey, it's what it is, right? Um Jalen Johnson, right? The value of Jalen Johnson, his max value. Is there a scenario where the Bears let him walk? I, you know, I've been going over this because I know a lot of people are very high on him, especially, you know, close friends of mine that I've talked to uh, are super set on trying to keep this guy. And I get it. And I've kind of remained consistent in my thought process that, you know, he's been very average. Right. And you brought up the fact where you're like, well, you think that because he doesn't get the numbers because he doesn't get the interceptions. And it's it's true. He doesn't. He plays uh, a position, you know, a cornerback where you guys pick off the ball a lot and he doesn't do that that much. And, and the, the two picks he had recently were against a backup quarterback and a third string quarterback. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt for what it's worth. And um, when I started kind of thinking about, okay, well, is Jalen Johnson truly worth keeping on this roster? Right. I, I thought about a couple different points. One, you're going to have to overpay him to keep him here. The question is how much are you willing to overpay him? But on a team like this, that's so depleted, that has so much cap room, it doesn't hurt you as much to overpay a player if you have to now, if, if you're tight on the cap, that's a different scenario. Then you, you need to sit there and have accurate contracts, but we have a ton of cap space. It won't hurt you that much to just overpay a guy for a couple of years. However, with that being said, you still don't want to drop, you know, get into bad contracts. You definitely don't want multiple bad contracts because that's how you drown yourself as a team. We saw that here with Phil Emery, right? So first thing I did was I said, okay, well, who's, potentially going to be available this year right as far as free agents go like if we don't sign Jalen Johnson and we look at the free agent market in the offseason who else can we sign instead now I don't necessarily know what these guys situations are on their teams and if they're going to be re-signed by their teams or not but currently right now we have you know I just have a list of seven names here like I said, seven games seven names I don't know I had the number seven <laughs> in my head so mm -hmm. Stefan Gilmore who's pretty old, but then as far as, you know, a bit younger guy goes, younger guys go, we have uh, Kendall Fuller, Kenny Moore, uh, Akella Witherspoon, Legereus Sneed, uh, Jerry Jacobs, Miles Bryant, right? Now, I also started looking into previous contracts that other teams have signed their quarterbacks to, right? And a couple names came up. So first one, the guy that seems like he got a little bit overpaid based off his production, which is probably pretty comparable to Jalen Johnson, is a guy that we know very well that's on the Green Bay Packers, uh, Jair Alexander. 
He was 25 years old when he signed. He got $21 million a year. And at the time when he signed, he had five interceptions total in four years and two forced fumbles. Now, I believe the year after he signed in his fifth year, he had five interceptions in that one year. So, you know, that that number doubled. But um, but when he did sign for $21 million a year, he only had five interceptions in his career. A guy like Marshawn Lattimore was 25 years old when he signed. He signed for $19.5 million a year, but he had 10 interceptions, and he had five forced fumbles. Okay? A guy like Denzel Ward was 24 when he signed. Um, he had 10 interceptions, two forced fumbles. He signed for $20.5 million a year. Um, a guy like Chavarius Ward was 26 years old when he signed. He only had four interceptions and one forced fumble, and he did not get re-signed by his team. He wound up getting picked up for another by another team for thirteen and a half million a year, right? So the number for Jalen Johnson's got to be somewhere within there, for between thirteen and a half to twenty-one million. You know, if he's asking for anything higher than that, that's insane in my opinion. I personally think eighteen million a year is where it's at, but um, with the guys I mentioned that are going to be available. Witherspoon is 28 years old, has 10 interceptions. He's played 69 games in seven years. Kenny Moore is 28 years old, has 17 interceptions, four forced fumbles, has played 96 games in seven years. Uh, Kendall Fuller, 16 interceptions, has played 111 games in eight years, two forced fumbles. Uh, Miles Bryant is 25 years old, only three interceptions, three forced fumbles. Uh, Jerry Jacobs is 26 years old, only four interceptions, 32 games played in three years. Uh, but the, the shining star, I think, out of this is Legereus Sneed, in my opinion. Um, 26 years old, he's got nine interceptions, four forced fumbles. Regardless, you could get – listen, there's going to be guys out there that are available that have made a career out of taking the ball away and getting interceptions and whatnot. Now, I like Jalen Johnson. I'm just not stuck on Jalen Johnson. Uh, what do you What do you think? I'm not stuck on Jalen Johnson either, personally. Um, I think when you write that list down of guys who are available free agents, I think depending on how good the – I think if you had a better situation on your defensive line, I think you could probably let Jalen Johnson go and sign a guy for $4 million less per year and probably have almost identical production, right? Um, but having said that, I think there is um, – I think there's something to be said – especially with the way Ryan Poles has conducted business as of now and not paying his current guys, that is problematic for for teams and players in the league moving forward. The Bears have never really had a reputation of necessarily being a – I'm sorry. The Bears have never really had a reputation necessarily of being a super pro player franchise. I don't know I, I don't know how to phrase this other than the like – the fact that they're just – they're – their areas have never been like very uh, family friendly for the players. They, you know, they, they're, I remember there was a story about Olin Krutz having to pay to have his family come to a game kind of thing, you know, just like little things like that and how you treat your players does resonate in the league. And that, that is a big deal. So the reason I feel like the bears almost need to pay Jalen Johnson is a for team culture and just showing some sort of commitment to guys who perform in house and that kind of adds like almost like two million dollars per year towards how much you need to overpay him so if jalen johnson is a 16 17 million dollar a year guy to kind of prove a point you should pay him 18 19. um when you compare all those numbers and stuff i also have an issue with a guy like jalen johnson who i would say he's worth in the 16 to 18 million dollar range in comparison to what the goes those guys that you comp- that you listed those are top five corners any way you cut it. And I don't think he's a top five corner, but he has stated that he wants to be paid like a top five corner. And having seen this in other sports, when a guy starts to perform in the contract year, it almost shows that, you know what, those stats were not an aberration. The fact that you never had an interception before you all of a sudden can get three, four interceptions in four weeks, right around contract negotiation time. So what, what are we, why aren't you doing this all the time? So there's something to be said about all these points. The other part of this is he's a solid corner on a bad team that has been here a while, and it shows some loyalty too. He's also 24 years old, which is a great, 
great age to sign a corner because if even if you sign Kendall Fuller, now you got to sign this guy to three, four years, and he's old. Now he's playing into his old days of the contract. Even if you overpay Jalen Johnson, at least he's ending his career here by 28, 29, and you can kind of live with that, right? Like he's gone by 28, 29, and if he stinks, you don't have to sign him to that extra contract for the end of his career and show that supreme loyalty that you do to a great player. And guess what? If he's like a five-time Pro Bowler by the time that first contract's up, you can show him that extreme loyalty. I just don't think – I think you have a lot more to lose by losing Jalen Johnson than you have to gain by getting cute and doing these cornerback swaps around the league, right? Because that happens a lot in a lot of positions every offseason where, oh, hey, we let Kendall Fuller go and Kansas City released LeJarrius Sneed, so we're going to sign him for a million dollars more than what Kansas City thought he was worth. Then Jalen Johnson is just going to go to Kansas City for $2 million less because he could do more and blah, blah, blah. And I just I think that I'd rather avoid that carousel and just keep a player that has kind of earned it, proven his loyalty to a team. And I think you if you need to overpay for that a little bit, I think it's worth it. I don't know. I could t- this could totally bite me in the ass. No, but I think you're right. Current moment in the current moment of what I see this team as, you know, you talk about needing players that show consistency and then hopefully you draft another corner that ends up being better than Jalen Johnson. And now Jalen Johnson's your second. That's the ideal situation for me with Jalen Johnson. But if you get a Montez Sweat, by the time you're really good, Montez Sweat should be your third best defensive lineman, should he not? Right? You should get a better defensive end, and you should get an Mm -hmm. absolute pocket-denting three-tech. So then Montez Sweat, being paid top five defensive end money, doesn't look stupid. It looks expensive, but it doesn't look stupid. The same way Jalen Johnson, hopefully being your second best corner, looks expensive, but it doesn't look stupid. That's my and, you point know, with signing Jalen Johnson. I, I say, you know, I talked about putting context into the statistics, right? So one of the things we've discussed in the past is a guy like Nate Basher, who had a seven-interception season in 2006. Why? Well, because there was pressure up front. Balls are right. flying everywhere, whichever way they would be. They're just up in the air for grabs, okay? So his seven interceptions were due to the fact that there was pressure up front and that was proven when he left the team, went somewhere else, and never, never achieved anywhere close to that ever again in his career. So, yeah, um, maybe the reason why Jalen Johnson hasn't gotten so many picks is because there's no pressure from the front four here. Like, you know, I mean, it, it, you're putting the guy in a bad position. Right, exactly. So he, all the balls – are not up in the air. No, they're on point on target and he's struggling to just sit there and hold his own and, and he's doing it. So yeah, listen for the guy's age and everything. I think you have to come to terms with him and you have to get a deal done with him. Even if it's a deal like Jair Alexander got, um, I, I personally, you eat it. You don't even really want to overpay and give him top five position money. But you know, if Jalen Johnson's not a top five corner, but he gets paid top five money, you did just do that with Montez Sweat. There's nowhere in the world where Montez Sweat is a top five defensive end, but you did just pay him top five money. And hopefully by the time Montez Sweat's contract is ending and that money starts to become free, you've replaced him with somebody better. And that's my logic with Jalen Johnson. Cornerbacks like to sign long contracts, four or five years. I could easily see a three-year, $70 million deal with Jalen Johnson, that would not make me super upset. You front load it with some signing bonus and you give him all the money up front. And then he's not a huge detriment to the cap hit three million. And he's making 22 a year or three years, 22 a year, but with a big signing bonus or something like that, I can live with that. Having said that, if that ruins the, if that ruins your flexibility on signing guys like Tevin Jenkins, then it's a different story. I think Darnell Mooney being gone is probably a foregone conclusion by now. Right. I think he's just going to be gone. And then a lot of this and all of the money that in our heads we were putting aside, again, we never talk about this like it's our money. I can't stand it when people talk about money that makes them mad and stuff. In our, When we discuss money and cap hits and all that stuff, it's because we understand how relevant that is to team building. We could not care less. Me and you never cared less about how much a guy's getting paid. Give them all the money. Give them all the money up front. If it doesn't affect your cap, make them the highest paid player of NFL history. Don't care one bit, right? My my big thing is you can't have. Yeah, no. My big thing is you can't have 
busts when you sign these guys. Like, for example, like a guy like Albert Haysworth getting $100 million and then just doing nothing, that's what right. kills you. You know what I mean? And when yeah. you get into these multiple bad contract situations where you have five or six bad contracts on a team, that's what kills you. But, but like, even Aramata's sweat, I feel like the floor – is at least going to be average. Like you're, you're going to get at least some production out of that, and that, that's fine if you. And I think you can say that about Jalen Johnson because at this rate, yep. Jalen Johnson has been your best secondary player by a lot for the last three years, and I don't see that changing unless Jaquan Brisker's special. Tyreek Stevenson is the hundred and fourth cornerback rated out of hundred and twenty-five rated in the position his first year. That could change a lot in second year and third year. But you need a guy like Jalen Johnson. Tyreek Stevenson's not ready. Terrell Smith's probably not ready. And then you haven't, and now you're putting yourself in a position where you need to either draft or overpay for a guy who's even more mid level. And the part that I was saying before this is a lot of this money and cap situation we were talking about at the beginning of the season was predicated heavily, assuming you need to pay your quarterback a lot. And if if Justin Fields is re signed right now, I think the league has learned from the New York Giants to not do it, right? I think you're better off letting him go and eat and biting that bullet, and maybe he'll be better somewhere else, but you can live with that. Personally, if Justin Fields wants a two-year, $45 million per year deal just to stay here so we can figure out if he's good or not, you know what? That's It's been really nice. If you figure out you're good somewhere else, then great. But, um you know, that money is somewhere else available now. The $50 million that you were supposed to pay a top-tier quarterback per year is now free to pay two guys, Montez Sweat and Jalen Johnson, and boom, you're good. And now you've got right. your rookie QB, your fifth-year option QB, and whoever you draft or Tyson Bajan. So now that money has to go somewhere else. And this is what we talked about, team building. You have two guys. You have a defensive end and a secondary guy locked down for three to four years to keep you afloat. Now you get to take some risks on some draft picks. This guy could be better than Jalen Johnson, and if he's not, guess what? We still got Jalen Johnson. This guy could be better than Montez Sweat, but if he's not, he's close to Montez Sweat, and we still got Montez Sweat. This is how you, in in a bad team, this is how you build. You need a three, four-year corner like Jalen Johnson. And again, when his contract expires, he's 27, 28, he can still go get a bag. But he can do it somewhere Right, else. just, or, just or like the rest of the guys I mentioned that are 28 years old. That right. you know what I mean? That are on that list, still yeah, good. for sure. So, and they're still good. Yep. So Definitely, I think so. I think he's worth that re-sign. I don't. I think the only way the Bears completely lose right now is just they lose him for nothing. You, uh, my prediction for the Panthers game. Damn it! Every time I predict them to win, they lose. They got to win this one. They can't beat the Panthers. What the hell are we doing? Um, I think that I I, I, I say like yeah. listen. I say like twenty eight. 17 and seven of those points come from a pick six. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, that's where I'm at. I think it's going to be a pathetic fest. I think it's going to be, you know, like when you watch a game and you're like, man, but their offense is better than our defense. It's like, well, their our defense is not as bad as their offense. And their defense I don't mean to cut is you not off. as bad as our defense. But how how awesome would it be to see an undrafted rookie free agent just completely outperform the number one overall pick? That would be great. I think Justin Fields is yeah. slated to start. No, I, I I've heard I've heard More, both oh. sides. Yeah, I've yeah. heard I've heard think, uh, so that they. There's part of me that you know whatever that your prediction is. I. I follow the Vegas stuff and all that. I, every Thursday night football game is an absolute under smash. And I haven't seen the over under on this game yet, but I would imagine it's like historically low, maybe 30, 28 and a half. Like I have never seen an under below like 30 this season. And even, even then I might take the under. I, I see like a 13-7 Bears win. 13-10. I think, okay. like you said, I can't fathom us losing. And if we do, it just shows that Bryce Young just got – he got pissed off or whatever and wanted to prove a point. But I or think, it just shows that – Oh, my Lord. Really Over-under is 39 and a half. Take the under and thank me later for all the money you make. <laughs> I know I've asked you to make gambling predictions because you are a degenerate gambler. Um, mm -hmm. no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but yeah. – uh, 
but I, but I know you do you do succeed in your gambling and whatnot. So, um, and I know you said you're not you're not all for making predictions like that. So for you to come out and just lay that one out there like that, you seem pretty confident, huh? I mean, I can't fathom. I can't fathom a twenty-one to twenty game. Can't I can't yeah. wrap my head around that. Because that's how yeah. that over hits. A 21 to 20 game. No, I can't no. wrap my brain around how that could possibly happen. I mean, I said 28. Even 14, if I even if it's the it's opposite, 30, it's the 42. Panthers just molly whopping the Bears. Yeah. I see that as more likely than the Bears just embarrassing the Panthers. But the Bears are favored I, by three and a half. So take the three and a half on the Panthers. And again, th- take the under and for the Panthers to cover and thank me later for your free money. I saw somewhere on Twitter, I think it was Spew again that said, you know, at least uh, thank God we have two wins because at least DJ Moore's not looking at the Panthers going well. I could have been better off there because he wouldn't yeah. have. But then I was like, hey, you know, one of our wins is probably credited towards CJ Moore. <laughs> so, yeah. so if he's on the Panthers, they might have the two wins and we might have the one, to be honest with you. So um, I hope he goes off. I think I think he's going to make a point on his former team. Man, but it's embarrassing. I believe – did I read this right? That uh, DJ Moore – and Velas Jones had the same amount of targets last game in the second half. In the, oh, in the second half, yeah. yeah. And you can't do that. No, nah, that's amazing. What are you doing? Yeah, what are you doing at so, that point? And and you know, and we feed Deeks, the guy. I saw Deeks' point on this too. I really like Deeks this season. In the last few games, I've been following him a lot closer, and he makes a lot of similar points to us. And props to him. But like, just the the lack of accountability. Like you know, hey, you know, we did everything right. Sometimes the players just need to perform better. Um, yeah, the Saints made some adjustments, and, you know, that's how the game goes. Well, then you counter-adjust. What are you talking about here? What do you, They adjust, and so we're stuck? Like, what are we doing? What is this? Dude, I've been the first to put the blame on the players and whatever, but I was thinking the same thing on my ride home from work today. I was like, man, it's very hypocritical that you sit there and you, you expect the players – to sit there and put all the blame on their subs. Like when the quarterback goes up to the podium, right? Yeah, you no, know, I got to do better. I got to do this. And, and you got to take the fault. But then you, as a coach, go up to the podium and just and there's, point I mean, your finger at everybody worst, else but coaching. yourself. Like, what? Like, come on. You got to. The one time Justin Fields actually pointed the finger at the coaching staff, tried to give them some accountability. Poor guy had to go apologize an hour later and say everything was taken out of context. Right. Why? No, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's like ridiculous. that's that's probably my least favorite thing about this coaching there's staff. Is there's blame just, everywhere to go around, except for, sure. for you know, it's all you, you know. Yeah.